and good afternoon, everyone. Um, we've got another full program for you today. I'm trying to give you as much information as we can. We're going to um, spend a, a few minutes today on the uh, PPP program uh, with Jeff Shear and Kate Schimmelwick. Then we're going to talk about the uh, new travel advisory um, executive order and guidance that's been issued with uh, Teresa Rusnick and Jessica Moeller. And then we're going to uh, finish up today with Katie Anderson with some thoughts on um, uh, continuing developments from Albany. We'll try and answer your questions as best we can throughout, but um, we will not probably have time to get to all of them. So uh, feel free to follow up with your uh, uh, bond attorney. So without further ado, let's turn it over to Jeff and Kate for an update on the, uh, you know, the latest happenings with the PPP program. Jeff, take it away. Great. Thanks, Pete. Uh, it's great to be back here uh, on the program and to give everybody an update on where we stand with the, uh, the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, first, uh, I just want to mention that uh, yesterday, I think yesterday, uh, we put on a, a webinar to review in detail the updated forgiveness application for the Paycheck Protection Program. And you'll find a link to that in the, uh, in the chat. Uh, room on the site that should be posted momentarily. Uh, so if you want uh, after this or at any point in time, you can go to that. It's about a 45 minute webinar running through the forgiveness application line by line. Uh, we included an example. Uh, so I think it's really helpful for everybody. So let's run into uh, the update uh, as to what's happened the last couple of weeks uh, since we haven't been on the program. Uh, there have been a couple of interim uh, rules that have come out. Um, as well as some, uh, some additional guidance and letters from the SBA. Uh, the first is the, uh, the salary cap for employees. Uh, if you remember, obviously, um, employee salary up to $100,000 is included uh, in your forgiveness amount. Um, because of the increase to a 24-week period, which I think we've mentioned before, because of the increase to a 24-week period, that salary cap has been increased to $46,154 for the 24-week period. However, um, owners have a salary cap equal to uh, two and a half months time their, uh, their monthly 2019 net profit, uh, up to a maximum of $20,833 for the 24-week covered period. And the reason the, uh, the, the, the SBA did this is uh, they didn't want the owners consuming all of the paycheck protection uh, loan monies. They wanted to make sure that there was a limit on owner employees uh, amounts um, within the 24 week period uh, so that the paycheck protection monies would be used predominantly for, uh, for employees. And that's why there's a limit of $20,833 for owner employees. Um, Again, that limit only applies for own employees, does not apply for any other employee who makes uh, over $100,000. Their limit is, is $46,154. Um, one of the really uh, great changes, and I know Kate's gonna get into a little bit, is that uh, there was guidance provided that uh, you can apply for forgiveness prior to the end of your 24 week period. So this question has come up quite a bit for those people that were maybe close to using their funds after eight weeks, um, ended up using them in full after 10 weeks or 11 weeks or 12 weeks. Um, you may apply for forgiveness after you, use, you have used up all of your funds. The caveat is that you need to certify that you're going to maintain your FTE counts and maintain your payroll for that full 24 week period. So you're basically applying early, but you're being treated as if you applied after 24 weeks. Um, you know, I still think that there is some benefit to applying early. It gets you in the queue. If you use the money for the intended purpose, no harm, no foul, but you will still be uh, subject to those requirements. And I know Kate's gonna get into that a little more. Um, uh, the SBA has stated this was not in an interim rule, but came out separately that um, all loans over $150,000 will be disclosed to the public. Um, so, uh, you know, I do have a number of clients that are, that are thinking about this. They're starting to put together their public statements just in case um, that there is a, uh, you know, an uproar or questions that are asked. Um, but I think it's good to know for everyone that did receive a loan over $150,000, that there will be a list that's provided and everyone will know uh, every entity that receives such a loan. Um, 
the last couple of weeks, and I mentioned uh, this a little earlier, there is a new easy application uh, that was provided. Um, in our webinar uh, that we put on yesterday that you can watch, um, the last 10 minutes or so of that webinar, 10, 12 minutes, does review the easy application. This application is for borrowers um, who have not had any FTE reductions, have not had any reduction in payroll over 25% during the covered period. Um, it's a simplified form. I think it might be two or three pages. Um, you have to certify uh, to the FTE and the wage reduction uh, limitations. And so long as you qualify, you can complete this simplified form. Um, and I think it's a really a great benefit because the, the full form happens to be, I think, 10 or 11 pages, very complicated in terms of listing out all employees and FTE counts. Um, and the simplified form lets you avoid doing any of that. Um, a couple weeks ago, there was some guidance um, and uh, exceptions to FTE headcounts. Um, if you were unable to, um, to maintain or unable to reach your, your typical business levels um, because of guidance from Health and Human Services, OSHA, or the CDC. Um, the question we had at the time is whether uh, state and local shutdown orders would count uh, for someone's inability to reach regular employment levels. And in fact, they do count. So for a lot of people who are in um, New York State and surrounding states, there have been uh, a plethora of executive orders that have shut down businesses and then eventually reopened them. So the fact that the state has shut down businesses, caused you to lay off people, um, and then brought them back later when things have started to reopen, the fact that you've shut down because of an executive order uh, will be an exception to the FTE headcount requirement. Um, you will have to document what that exception is. Um, so we should all listen to Katie Anderson at some point and later and, and review our executive orders to know which executive order shut down which, shut down which business and which uh, reopened it. So we can provide that documentation together with our forgiveness application. Um, the last uh, thing I wanna mention before I turn this over to Kate um, is that uh, if the, there, there are FTE headcount exceptions for employees who reject uh, an offer to be rehired, um, uh, we've mentioned previously that all of that has to be documented. Um, the addition that, that has now come into play is that you must also have documentation that shows that you've tried to hire a similarly qualified individual. So not only do you document the fact that you terminate, that, that someone has, was laid off, that you tried to rehire them back, um, but you need to document the fact that you tried to hire a similarly qualified individual. And if you're unable to do so, that will be uh, included as a de minimis exception uh, to the FTE headcount requirement. Um, so lastly, now really lastly, I know it's the last one was last, but really lastly, the SBA has um, reiterated the fact that they're gonna, they can review all applications, not just those over $2 million. Um, they can review all applications and review the, um, uh, uh, review the loan amount, review the forgiveness amount, um, and review your employee count. Because remember, only employers that had less than 500 employees would qualify for the PVP program. Um, all of these things are on the table for review uh, by the SBA when you go to apply for forgiveness or thereafter. So with that, I do wanna pass it over, over to my colleague, Kate Schmelowick, um, who will go through some uh, FAQs that came up yesterday during our webinar um, and that seem to be uh, pretty commonly asked questions. So Kate, it's over to you. Thanks, Jeffrey. All right, so yesterday, when the, one of the questions that we received multiple times was something that Jeffrey had already talked a little bit about at the beginning of today's webinar, which is, can I apply for forgiveness prior to 24 weeks? Yes. The SBA made that clear last week that you can apply early. However, it doesn't actually cut your 24 week period short. So there was this idea that if you, let's say, for example, ran out of money at week 12, you could apply for forgiveness at week 12 and just have a 12 week covered period. That is not the case. You can apply at week 12. However, it's presumed that you have a full 24 week period. So as Jeffrey mentioned, if you're in a situation um, where you've already reduced um, salaries um, and haven't actually restored them by the end of that 24 week period, 
When you do your calculations on your application form, you're going to be indicating that salary reduction for the full 24 weeks. Therefore, in certain situations where let's say uh, an employer is thinking about bringing um, the salaries back up to normal levels, um, or I should say uh, uh, reference period levels, they may be better off waiting to apply for forgiveness um, later after they've, after they've done that because it may actually uh, look better on their applications, not having that presumption of that salary reduction for the entire time period. We still have we still have questions though. Um, so one of those one of those questions is regarding FTE headcounts. Um, if you apply for forgiveness, let's say at week twelve, and end up um, reducing headcounts after that, how does that affect your application for forgiveness? If you've already now certified and um, sent in an application based on other numbers, um, we're not sure if the SBA is going to have a look back period for those early forgiveness applications. Um, we, we just don't know yet and we're keeping our eyes on it to see um, how, how that potentially will shake out. Um, and again, same thing to with penalties. We're not sure how, how that will end up looking. All right, one of the next questions that we got was what kind of documents um, do you need to provide uh, to prove that you were unable to operate at 100%? As Jeffrey just mentioned, it's going to be the state and federal and local orders um, mandating that the business be closed or operate at a limited capacity. Um, for most, most employers here in New York, it's going to be the executive orders that Katie Anderson has talked quite a bit about. Um, so it's gonna be very important that you understand and document um, those orders that require your business to operate at less than 100%. All right, next question. Do you need to hire furloughed employees back by the last day of the 24 week period? And as a follow-up to that, is the June 30th date that we've talked so much about no longer important? All right, so to the last question, correct. The June 30th date is no longer relevant. That date um, was extended to December 31, 2020 um, in the Paycheck Protection Flexibility Act. So the new, the new safe harbor date is December 31, 2020. June 30th is no longer relevant. Um, you do not need to rehire your furloughed employees back by the last harbor. Again, that's going to be December 31, 2020. So if an employer is using the 24-week period, and let's say um, their period ends in October, if they rehire people and rehire all of their people and restore their headcounts by December 31, then they would qualify for the safe harbor. Um, are owners included in Table 2 of the PPP Worksheet Schedule A? No. No owners are included on your PPP Schedule A. It is just um, uh, your employees who make over and under $100,000. Um, the owners are, the owner's compensation is included on the PPP um, Schedule A, but not the worksheet. If an employee's standard work week is not 40 hours, um, so for example, seven and a half hours per day is um, for five days is a 37 and a half hour work week, um, is the measurement for the FTE calculation still 40 hours? It is. So the where this where this comes out is when you're looking at your FTE counts for your reference period and then your covered period. If you if if full time for your company was 37 and a half hours for both reference periods, then you're not going to see any type of penalty or reduction um, for using a 37 and a half hour work week because in that situation, um, they're both going to be um, 0.9s um, compared to a full one. Um, so it cancels each other out. Okay, are we prohibited from allocating more than 60% or even all of um, our PPP funds for payroll expenses? There's no prohibition on using more than 60% on payroll expenses. You will not be penalized for using more than 60% of your um, funds on payroll expenses. That, that is not an issue. The only time that you're going to see a reduction or a penalty um, is if you use less than 60% of your funds on payroll expenses. If I paid an hourly employee $20 for a 40 hour work week and kept their pay at $20, but reduced them to 20 hours a week, so here there's no change in wages, it's just hours, is there a wage reduction? How about if there's no longer overtime, but the hourly wage stayed the same? So in both of these situations, the hourly wage did not change. Therefore, there is no, um, 
uh, wage um, reduction calculation that needs to be done. However, in the example, the first example, there would be a FTE reduction because hourly uh, hours did drop. And then in the second example for the overtime, there's a maximum of a 1.0 for your FTEs. So there, if you have somebody who's, who has overtime and who normally works, say, 50 hours a week um, with their overtime, they're still capped at a 1.0. All right. Um, so you're not going to you're not going to see reductions based on um, that as long as the hourlies have not changed. All right. Do you have to use the same FTE period calculation that was used in the initial application? So I think there's a little bit of confusion here that it's a great opportunity to clear up. In your original loan application, the SBA wanted to know how many employees that you had, total employees, not FTEs, just it's straight number of employees, part-time, um, full-time, just your straight number. And the reason why they needed that number was there was a threshold for um, employers to qualify for a loan of um, for 500 employees or less qualified for the loan. And it was not 500 FTE employees, which is straight 500 employees. For the forgiveness application, you're actually looking at your full-time equivalents, um, which is now the calculation that we've talked about that it's either um, done by tenths um, or the simplified method of one in 0.5. Okay, what utilities are included? Utilities are gonna be electric, gas, water, telephone, transportation, and internet access. Are S-Corp shareholders who receive W-2s considered owners or employees? So in this situation, they would be considered owners, and therefore they would not be listed on Table 2 of the Schedule A worksheet. Um, if there, however, if there's only one, one shareholder, and they are the sole employee, the sole shareholder, then in that situation, they um, can use, they should be able to use the easy application because it's, it's just one person. Um, if you fire an employee for cause and they are in your base FTE calculation, can you exclude them even if you hire a replacement employee? So this is a situation where the SBA does not allow you to double dip. So if you have hired a replacement employee, then you would count that new employee in the FTE counts and no longer claim the FTE re exception for the terminated employee. Otherwise, you would be claiming the exception for the terminated employee and the new hire. And in that case, you would have two FTEs instead of just really the one FTE for the replacement. So no double dipping there. Um, if an employee was out on disability when the covered period started, do you still count them as an employee? Yes, as long as they're still an employee and just on disability, um, they're still on your payroll, um, that's completely still covered. They are considered an employee. What do I do if New York State has not been responsive to reports of employees refusing work and collecting unemployment? So this is a situation where we're still waiting on additional guidance from the SBA. I think I mentioned that yesterday during the webinar. However, in the meantime, until we receive that guidance, um, the best thing that anybody could do is document, document your attempts to notify New York State of the um, situation, um, make sure that they're in writing, and that you have documents to show that you've attempted to notify the state. Um, all right, and so that those are the major questions um, that we saw yesterday um, based on our webinar. And I'm, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Pete. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Kate and Jeff. Uh, appreciate it. And, and as Jeff says, uh, feel free to you know check out the webinar from yesterday. The, the questions keep coming, um, and there are a lot of uh, individual circumstances that uh, have permutations. So uh, feel free to reach out if you need some individual consultation. We've also gotten already a number of questions in our Q&A function regarding the travel advisory, not surprisingly. So um, we've got uh, a couple of um, experts here to, uh, to walk you through it. Let's start with Teresa Rusnick uh, in our Rochester office to give us the overview. Take it away, Teresa. Thank you, Pete. I'm not surprised that there are questions already about the travel advisory. Jessica and I, and I would say just about every other attorney at Bond, it's been getting a number of those since this first came out. And that was on June 24th, so last week, not even a full week ago, we had Executive Order 205, which states very simply that if you travel as a New Yorker or come to New York from a state that has 10 
for 100,000 residents with a, high, with a positive test rate of COVID-19 over a seven day average, or a testing positivity rate higher than 10% over a seven day average, you need to quarantine for 14 days upon arriving in New York State. So that's all Executive Order 205 says. It doesn't give a list of restricted states. It doesn't make any essential employees. All of that was left to guidance published by the Department of Health on the same day. So the list of states that are restricted travel areas New York State has published on its website. It is something that New York State has said it's going to update weekly, but it may also update as, as often as daily. Um, and we've seen that as of this morning, the list has been updated again. Initially, we only had seven restricted states. We are now up to 16. Um, so that is something you're definitely going to want to check when it comes to where your employees are allowed and are not allowed to go and what the implications for that are. So right now, our states are Alabama, Arkansas, Arizona, California, Florida, Georgia, Iowa, Idaho, Louisiana, Mississippi, Nevada, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, and Utah. So if you do the math, that's just over 30% of the states in the country. Um, and I would expect that that list is growing, certainly as we see the number of COVID-19 cases continue to rise in other states. The updating of this list shows that New York is, is right on top of that news and is willing to restrict accordingly. So with that, that takes me to the Department of Health's guidance document that they published on June 24th. So the same day as Executive Order 205 came out, Department of Health published this guidance just a couple of hours later. And it's this guidance that really differentiates between different types of employees and how Executive Order 205 is going to affect different types of employees. So there's gonna be three different categories of employees I'm gonna talk about that the guidance uses. And the first one is non-essential employees. We've been talking about essential and non-essential employees for weeks now, ever, months really, ever since COVID-19 started in New York State. New York State has made a differentiation between employees which are considered essential and non-essential. And then within that category, we'll also talk about essential employees who are returning to New York State, who are New York State residents or who regularly live in New York State. And then those essential employees who are just coming to New York for a finite period of time. So starting with non-essential employees, per the Department of Health guidance and per Executive Order 205, those people, when they come back to New York State, must quarantine for 14 days. The DOH guidance has a list of, of different bullet points that the people must follow when they come back to the states, uh, to New York State, but to an employer's point, really what's most important for you to know is that they cannot come to work for 14 days. Uh, for the individual, there is an entire list of other criteria for them to follow. Importantly for everyone to know, um, there is a penalty attached to not filing, to not following that 14 day quarantine. Um, the penalty can be rather high and of course, New York State in the DOH guidance has listed a number and a website that people can call if they feel that others are not quarantining appropriately upon returning to the state. So that's all out there for you and your employees to read at your leisure. So that's non-essential employees. They need to uh, quarantine for 14 days when they come back to New York State if they went to a restricted travel area. Then for essential employees, the DOH guidance talks about essential employees who are in New York uh, for a short, medium, or long-term period, which is defined as uh, less than 12 hours, less than 36 hours, and then over 36 hours, respectively. So for each of those periods of time, and again, these are for essential workers who are coming into New York to do a specific job or, or to perform some kind of, of task, but not necessarily living or returning to New York, they would follow the short, uh, medium, or long-term guidance. And then there's different uh, levels of testing and, and requirements that they have to follow depending on which category they fall into, which again is defined by both them being an essential worker and the amount of time that they're going to be staying in the state. For New York uh, employees returning to the state who, who live in New York, who work in New York, it's a little bit different. The DOH guidance is not 
I will be upfront a picture of clarity when it comes to differentiating between essential employees who are returning to New York and essential employees who are just traveling to New York to perform a specific task. But as best we can tell, the DOH guidance says that if an essential employee who lives and works in New York is returning to New York, they are not subject to the 14-day quarantine. Um, they are subject instead to the guidance for essential workers, either for their specific industries, such as nursing homes or manufacturing, or they're subject to New York State's general guidance on essential workers returning to work. Um, so please keep that in mind that there is a distinction between those three categories of workers, um, and that's all laid out, or more or less laid out, in the DOH guidance and Executive Order 205. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jessica, who is going to tell you the employee leave implications uh, of this executive order and the DOH guidance, both under New York State and federal law. Thank you, Teresa. Um, and, and so I will say uh, right off the bat, you know, I echo Teresa's words that this this is not the picture of clarity. Um, there are a lot of questions that have been raised by both the executive order uh, itself, the, the Department of Health guidance, and uh, you know, right off the bat, a, a good rule of thumb that I would I would suggest uh, for anyone dealing with these issues is, uh, if you if there's any question, and really to determine the extent to which the travel advisory mandatory quarantine uh, applies to your your business and your employees, uh, that you definitely uh, speak with the attorney that you work with in order to really uh, you know go through and discuss and flesh out all of the potent potential implications here because we're dealing with uh, you know executive orders different laws on the state and federal side and uh, it, it it does get to be a rather complicated issue with uh, you know a lot of potential different outcomes depending on the the particular circumstance um, and so you know one one thing that is uh, clear um, on the employee leave uh, side of things with regard to the executive order um, is, is, you know, we have the, the state law and we have the federal law that, that many employers are dealing with. Um, the state law that I'm referring to, of course, is the New York State uh, COVID paid sick leave law. And the federal law that I'm referring to, of course, is the uh, FFCRA. Uh, and, and within the FFCRA, particularly the emergency paid sick leave portion of that law. Um, but, but under both of those, those laws, the one thing that is clear is that if you have an employee, even if that employee is subject to a quarantine and, and can't come into the workplace and can't you know, physically be there to work, if that employee is able to work from home, then they're able to work from home and they don't necessarily trigger either of the two different laws on the, the state side or the federal side. Um, and so if you have an employee who is perfectly healthy, not exhibiting symptoms, not having tested positive, but is simply now uh, coming to you and saying, I can't come to work because I traveled to one of these restricted states and now I need to quarantine per uh, the executive order and Department of Health guidance, if that employee is able to work remotely, then it, it's a very simple answer. It's a very uh, simple, clear answer that th those laws are not triggered because you can work remotely. Um, that, that's not going to necessarily be the answer now for every employee because of course not every employee can actually work from home and, and can't necessarily work remotely. So, so there are potential issues that are going to arise under both the state law and the federal law. Um, but, but one of the other uh, issues that is fairly clear here is, um, you know, Teresa mentioned that under the, the De Department of Health guidance implementing this executive order, there are exceptions to the mandatory quarantine requirement for employees who are deemed essential. And, um, you know, for example, it, it lists that an essential worker, an essential employee includes any individual employed by an entity included on the Empire State Development essential business list. 
And so if you as a business, as an employer, fit within uh, that list, the ESD list of essential businesses, then you could potentially take advantage of this essential worker uh, exception for your employees. And so if your employees who are now saying, I can't come to work you know, because I have to quarantine, it, if your employees fit within that essential worker definition, then in fact, the mandatory quarantine does not actually apply to them. They're accepted out of this mandatory quarantine requirement and, <clears throat> and therefore they're not under any kind of governmental restriction, any kind of governmental uh, order or directive instruction or whatnot to quarantine upon returning to travel. So, so that, that too is a fairly easy uh, question with regard to the leave implications here. The, the more complicated issues arise, however, when uh, you have a situation where your employees do not fit within the essential worker um, exception and they're not able to work remotely. Uh, so, so we're talking about the non-essential uh, workforce that can't work uh, remotely. And so, so, so what happens with that employee? Do they, or does that employee, do those employees get the benefits under either the state COVID sick leave law or the federal FFCRA. Um, and, and that question has, has been asked by many people and there are a lot of opinions uh, and a lot of different views and perspectives that uh, you know, I, I've, I've seen, I've talked to uh, people about um, with regard to those, those answers. So um, the state, the governor's office, fortunately, I will say over this past weekend did clarify things somewhat for purposes of at least the state law. <clears throat> um, so in addition to having issued Executive Order 205 last week, over the weekend the governor issued Executive Order 202.45 um, and in that order what the governor essentially did was extend an exception that was already built into the state law for international travel to now apply to domestic travel when somebody is going to one of these restricted states on a voluntary, non-work related uh, purpose. <clears throat> so essentially, you know, someone saying, I want to go vacation in Florida, um, you know, uh, no work related reason to, to go there. I'm just going there for my own purely personal reasons. Now, my travel to that restricted state um, does now fall within this exception that had already been built into the state law. And, and what the state law has, has done with regard to this exception is said that if I engage in that kind of voluntary travel to one of these hotspot areas, then I don't get the paid leave benefits that are provided for under the state law when I return and now have to quarantine as a result. So I will say um, the, the state law sets out some specific requirements with regard to notice that needs to be provided to employees um, when they engage in that kind of voluntary international travel. Um, and, and the executive order 202.45 does not specifically address whether that same notice needs to be provided uh, to an employee who travels domestically to one of the hotspot uh, restricted states. Um, and, and I will say, however, um, that just this morning, uh, I, I checked in the, the state guidance on the website uh, specifically says that the, the <clears throat> expansion of the travel exception under 202.45 was intended to mirror the law's existing provision uh, with regard to international travel. And so if it's intended to mirror the previously existing exception, uh, you know, I would say be on the safe side and, and provide the notice uh, to employees about how this travel that they're engaging in is going to impact their ability to get paid leave benefits. And, and essentially what that notice is, is telling employees that if you voluntarily travel to one of these restricted states, um, 
that when you come back and if you need to mandatorily quarantine as a result of your travel, you're not going to get paid by the uh, New York State COVID paid sick leave uh, benefits. Now they might be uh, entitled to, and actually the law says uh, with this exception that they would be entitled to uh, use their own PTO for that time. They would be entitled to an unpaid leave if they don't have PTO, but, but the notice tells them at least you're not going to be entitled to use paid sick leave benefits um, they're provided for under the, <clears throat> the COVID law. So, so that's, you know, fortunately at least uh, a bit of clarification that we've gotten on the, uh, uh, the, the leave question under state law. But of course, um, for employers uh, at least, uh, you know, with 500 or fewer employees in public sector, uh, who, who also have to deal with uh, the, the issues and, and restrictions and obligations set out <clears throat> under the federal FFCRA paid sick leave law, um, we need to ask the same kind of question with regard to uh, that law and, and make a determination of whether this uh, executive order and relating Department of Health guidance constitutes an order of quarantine for purposes of triggering the paid sick leave benefits under the FFCRA. Um, and, and you know, to echo Teresa's words uh, from, from previously, this too is not the picture of clarity. Um, and, and what I would say is the definition um, of a, a quarantine or isolation order um, that is uh, sufficient to trigger the benefits under the federal law is fairly broad. Um, reading directly from the, the regulations under the federal law, it, it specifically says that uh, a quarantine, for purposes of the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act, a quarantine or isolation order includes quarantine, isolation, containment, shelter in place, or stay at home orders issued by any federal, state, or local government authority that cause the employee to be unable to work even, th even though his or her employer has work. Uh, that the employee could perform. This also includes when a federal, state, or local government authority has advised categories of citizens to shelter in place, stay at home, isolate, or quarantine, causing those employees to be unable to work. Now, that's a fairly broad definition, um, and, and we don't have a definitive uh, answer that I can provide, you know, here today on whether uh, your particular situation and, and your particular uh, employee that you may be dealing with uh, and the, <clears throat> the travel advisory and guidance is going to be sufficient to trigger that. Uh, and so I would say, uh, you know, best bet is to speak with your attorney and really depend, you know, determine the extent to which uh, the, potential, uh, the potential implications uh, and, and triggering uh, event under the FFCRA are, are really going to come into play in, in your particular context. You know, because there are also other considerations that need to be uh, considered as part of that analysis. For example, um, under the FFCRA, the law is clear that you only get the benefit of the paid sick leave once. So for a full-time employee who works 40 hours a week, that means they can get up to the 80 hours of paid sick leave, but they only get it once. They don't get it for every single qualifying reason. And so if you have an employee, for example, who has already utilized all of that time for one of the other non-quarantine related reasons, childcare, uh, you know, I'm, I'm self-isolating and, and seeking a medical diagnosis. Um, if, if I've already used up my time available, for one of those other reasons, I don't get it again now. So regardless this, of this, this quarantine, travel-related quarantine, um, my situation may very well, the answer might be that I don't get the right, I don't get the benefit under the FFCRA because I've already used up uh, what's available to me. <clears throat> um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and, and one of the other, uh, you know, things to, to consider is, um, 
again, if I'm an essential worker, as I discussed before, I'm not, you know, and I'm fit within the exception, I'm not going to be under a governmental order of quarantine if this travel advisory does not actually apply to me. And so, um, you know, that too would put me outside of the FFCRA uh, triggering benefit. So with that, I will say, uh, you know, speak with your attorney and uh, Pete, I turn it back over to you. Thanks, thanks Jessica and, and Teresa. Um, I guess just to, it, it, this is more by way of comment. I'm not gonna try and go back over uh, what, what you both covered in um, excellent fashion, but the complexity of this and the difficulty of uh, interpreting and implementing, you know, um, an executive order and guidance. I mean, the interesting thing here, frustrating thing perhaps, is that, you know, these things come out and we immediately have as many questions as are answered. And you know, then we get another executive order that answers some of those questions, but leaves uh, many other questions still to be you know determined. So, um, and I'm seeing it in the chat as well here that a lot of people are asking you know specific questions relative to their factual situation. We just can't quite get into that level of detail this afternoon. But feel free to call us, or I, I suspect we'll be doing you know some pop-up webinars on this as well to you know try to answer some of these questions. But um, it's a complicated issue and it is rapidly changing. Um, what are we, six days after Teresa mentioned that the executive order is issued and got a whole bunch of new states and a whole bunch of things to consider. Um, let's shift gears though and uh, let's turn to Katie. Um, Katie Anderson in our Albany office uh, with some updates uh, on some, some different issues and related issues. Katie, take it away. It's all related at this point, right? It's all, it's all just one, one big thing. Uh, first thing, you know, always like to start with where we are with reopening. Uh, this is where we are. Uh, Western New York, congrats. You started phase two today. Uh, Capital Region has not been officially cleared at this point um, to enter tomorrow, but I assume uh, tomorrow the Capital Region will enter phase four. Um, here's just a, another graphic of where we are uh, visually, you know, one thing to look at here is New York City is projected to enter phase three on July 6th. This, uh, that date, remember it, because it relates to what else has happened in Albany this week. Um, we'll start with that. How about this? We'll start with New York City. You know, phase three is going to look different, most likely. Uh, the governor is expected to announce tomorrow that indoor dining will likely not be occurring at the same rate in New York City um, that it's occurring elsewhere in the state for phase three. The main concern about that is uh, you have COVID increasing in 38 states at this point. Um, lots of the spikes are as a result of indoor dining bars um, and being you know, in that small space uh, without face coverings on. So that is the, the first concern, you know, we're going to see the governor and all of us want to avoid a COVID spike in New York state. Um, we did it. And so we don't need to do it again. So the governor is really trying to tailor, um, all of these things are tailoring New York's response. You know, we'll turn to the next thing on the, the next bullet below New York city, because we've received a few questions about it. It's about malls and filtration systems. Yesterday, the governor uh, announces that they're looking into requiring malls to have high quality filtration systems. And I wrote down what they are. It says a uh, high efficiency particulate air filter system. So it's H-E-P-A uh, filter systems. Um, they're looking into it at this point. It's unclear um, whether that's going to be required for malls. It's unclear whether that's going to be, um, you know, yesterday in the press conference, the governor said best practices for uh, businesses is to go get that. Um, there is, you know, lots of experts um, on either side of this saying this doesn't necessarily uh, get rid of COVID in the air system. Um, so it's really up in the air right now on the air filtration system. Uh, we may know, may know more by next week, um, but we may not. Uh, I know that's not a great answer for everybody, but it's the best one that I have for you right now. You know, 
A secondary issue here too, um, related to malls and the filtration system is this, it's actually the federal judge uh, bullet, the second bullet there. The federal judge, uh, Gary Sharp, granted a preliminary injunction about re restrictions uh, for religious gatherings. So what is crucial here is there are two, there are three main components of this decision, right? First component of it is indoor religious gatherings um, have to be allowed in New York State at this point to have to follow the 50% occupancy restriction that are on phase two businesses. Um, basically, the religious uh, benefits have to be equal to the benefits gr granted uh, with secular gatherings uh, and secular businesses. So indoor, first thing, indoor religious ceremonies, it is up to 50% of the max occupancy. Uh, second component of it, and this is a big one, Outdoor uh, gatherings are unlimited at this point for religious gatherings. Social distancing must continue. Face coverings must continue, but religious gatherings can have be of any size so long as social distancing and mask wearing is occurring. Um, this is because there are because of the protests in New York State. Um, they the judge reasoned that if this is allowed the protests are allowed to go on then religious gatherings of any size need to be allowed to go on as well do not try to push this too far is my one advice um i expect that we will see that being pushed uh in the future for businesses who want to host weddings for example on their grounds um of a certain size you know the the real issue comes when people are sitting down and eating uh and and so just watch out for that. That is a big decision. Uh, we're going to be putting out an information memo to get more in depth on that. Um, you know, going up to the top two, this is not something I've really spoken about at all much, but there were primary elections last week. Um, the primary elections, just to, in summary, the ballot, ballots haven't been counted yet. New York sent approximately 2 million absentee ballots before the primary election. Um, it appears that there are uh, going to be quite a number of new people in the state legislature and in Congress um, for New York representatives. Um, it's a lot of younger progressives who beat older progressives <laughs> um, in elections. And so it's, you know, we're seeing a generational shift in New York State. And then finally, we have more executive orders, and I do su suspect that one will be coming out uh, today. This chart you know, it's, we're gonna make it look a little bit prettier, but this was my thing that I had to try to do this morning, um, was it, going over what orders extend what other orders, because it is so confusing. Uh, Executive Order 202.45 came out on Saturday, on Friday night, um, and it extended, for example, 202.34. Well, 202.34 extended 202.31. What did 202.31 extend? 202.28. What did 202.28 extend? Everything. So this is, you know, it is becoming so confusing to keep up with how this is happening. Um, for those of you with, uh, you know, that are on laptops right now uh, who can, I strongly urge you to screenshot that while you can. Um, it will be going out in a graphic at some point this week. Um, but you know, if this is something that's of interest to you, please take it, uh, use it however you want. Um, this is a very confusing thing. So uh, with that, I believe I covered it. Um, and that's what's been going on in Albany. Katie, thanks. And I, I, I think that slide just illustrates for me, I mean, you know, to the extent that people have, you know, photographic memories and can recall what's in the various orders, I mean, this is just how complicated it is. That orders have been issued, orders modifying orders, orders extending orders, um, and then of course there's guidance on top of that, and, and that is just the, the way it has been. So, um, and the way I think it will continue to be uh, for the reasonably foreseeable future. So we'll just have to keep monitoring this um, as we go. And we'll be there for you to help you do that. Um, we're gonna continue our Tuesday webinar series for the foreseeable future. 
Um, we did have a lot of questions today. We'll try and get to those offline, but feel free to call us uh, if you really need an answer quickly. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, have a good week and stay safe.